Tonight, the Academy is very privileged to have Jim Furnish. He spent 34 years with Forest Service, um, was the supervisor of the Sayusla National Forest, knows this area very well, took over at a very difficult time, spotted all dispute, was in full rage. Uh, the Forest Service was making a transition from timber harvest to recreational and saving old growth. And also women were being put into positions of leadership and power. Totally new for the Forest Service. How many here worked for or are working for U.S. Forest Service? Just raise your hand. I figured there was a few here. So please welcome Jim Furnish. Thank you, Don. Uh, real simply, the reason I'm here is you're here. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming out tonight. Uh, I hope this is going to be a truly enjoyable night where you're going to be able to celebrate with me and others this documentary video, the book. I think this is your story that we're trying to tell. Um, the people who've lived here on the coast and enjoy the national forest. Um, I think this video is really going to warm your heart. Uh, it's extremely well done, and the first thing I want to do is introduce the producer and journalist, Alan Honig. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the germ of the idea about this video. Um, Alan did another video uh, 20 years ago called Torrents of Change. Um, and this was after the, uh, the big Pineapple Express hit the Oregon coast in the mid-90s, uh, kind of blew up our road system uh, and everything else. I mean, it was just one of those huge storms. Uh, and why is it these 100-year storms keep showing up every year, five or 10 years? <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, this was, uh, this was at a time when the Sayusla National Forest was just coming off the shoulder of decades of active timber harvest and tremendous road construction activity, and, and we had a very vulnerable landscape. Uh, roads, uh, particularly in this steep country in the wintertime where everything's wet, don't fare well when they encounter a lot of pressure from these big winter rainstorms. And uh, we had just undertaken a couple years of very arduous effort in trying to close a lot of our roads and, and really protect this land from the catastrophic damage that can occur from these storms. And when that storm hit, there was really a story to tell because it was evident that a lot of the work we'd been doing on the roads was really working. And uh, Andy Stahl with uh, Forest Service Employees for Environmental Ethics approached me about teaming up on a uh, project to actually create a documentary about the, the Sayusla. What happened when the storm hit retained Alan to, to do that video documentary. Um, and you'll see uh, some, some snippets of that in this video tonight. Um, Alan approached us about two and a half years ago and said, I would really like to create a sequel to Torrents of Change uh, and talk about what has happened on the Oregon coast in the last 20 years. It's such an incredible story. And I would, I would say this to you. I cannot think of one national forest in the United States that is a more unlikely candidate for what has happened here. This, this was the, the, the belly of the beast, so to speak, when it came to timber production. Uh, it's one of the most productive timber landscapes in the world. And on a per acre basis, this national forest put out more timber than any other in the country. Uh, that is not what's happening today. Um, there were a number of circumstances that you hear about that forced change. Uh, upon us. Uh, the Sayusla has navigated uh, these turbulent waters for the last couple decades, and I think there's a real success story that this documentary seeks to tell, and I really believe it's your story. These are your lands. This is your neighborhood, and I hope this speaks to some of your love affair with our national forests. So let's watch the video, and then we'll carry on from there.
trees that fall into streams in the forest play a number of critical roles. They slow the rushing waters during floods, protecting young fish and other species. They create pools and trap gravels for spawning adults. They hold on to smaller organic debris that nourishes the entire web of life. Trees fall into streams through natural causes, such as landslides, erosion, and storms. But these trees didn't come to be here naturally. We're putting wood in the river now, basically as a temporary measure until we can grow large trees near our fish bearing streams again. A lot of those large trees that we'd expect to be there now, naturally, we removed. What they didn't realize is the juvenile fish need all those log jams to slow the water down so they don't get flushed downstream. We basically have a legacy on the landscape where we don't have a lot of large trees along our fish bearing channels to fall in naturally. And so we're putting wood in until we can grow it there and fall in naturally on its own. Large trees were missing from fish bearing channels because for 40 years, the mission of the Sayusla National Forest was focused on timber. That mission changed dramatically in 1991. A federal judge had just enjoined all timber sale activity in spotted owl habitat. And the Sayusla, all of the Sayusla was spotted owl habitat. Some people might quickly blame the owl, but really the blame was with the Forest Service itself. We hadn't been prescient enough or far-sighted enough to realize that what we were doing were laying the seeds of our own destruction. It caught up with us, and the door slammed shut. That was the spotted owl, and then it was the salmon, and then it was the marble mullet, and then it was judges saying, you know, it's the whole ecosystem. It's the whole forest. And until if you, Forest Service, start thinking about the whole forest, we're not going to let you walk. In the decades prior to the Spotted Owl ruling, the Forest Service in the South Law saw primarily the trees, an abundant and seemingly endless renewable resource. Today, its mission encompasses all of the benefits of a healthy forest. Why and how did this evolution take place? Part of the answer lies in the nature of the forest itself. The Sayusla occupies Oregon's central coast range, with portions that extend to the sea. The wettest parts receive over 100 inches of rain each year, making it one of the most productive temperate forests on the planet. It is wet, it is warm, the soils are rich. These trees grow like crazy out here. That productivity made an incredible wealth of timber that was there to be extracted. The wealth was too tempting. The productivity is so incredible here that this is the place where that conflict was going to come to a head. And it did. At the height of the conflict, Furnish was appointed supervisor of the Science Law. The Sayus Law was approaching utter chaos. I didn't have a grand plan for moving forward. I just knew that we needed to do something radically different. He was the leader of an organization viewed with bitterness and skepticism. Timber workers blamed him for lost jobs, and environmentalists blamed him for enabling the destruction of the forest ecosystem. They had resoundingly lost the public's trust. Only when the Forest Service had fallen so out of favor with the public, the disconnect this is a critical point. This between, is a critical point. between what it was doing and what the public would accept, only when that gap had become so big did the Forest Service start reaping the whirlwind in response. And the politicians had to step in. That, that's when you invite political influence. That's right. Political influence came in 1993 in the form of a forest summit convened by the newly elected president. Both sides came out in the streets to voice their anger and frustration. At the end, Clinton laid out the task. I intend to direct the, the cabinet and the entire administration to begin work immediately to craft a balanced, a comprehensive, a long-term policy. Here we're 
are trying to create diversity. It's a lot gappier. Look like you're going for a certain size tree. In fact, it's not even so much that we're going for a specific size. We're going deliberately for the gaps and the clumps and the diversity of structure. You're already doing things differently yeah. than we would. In fact, if I were to look at this in terms of what we had in mind 20 years ago, I would have thought this was very edgy, uh -huh. almost dangerous, <laughs> kind of right out of my comfort zone. Yeah. The process that had begun at Clinton's Forest Conference resulted in the Northwest Forest Plan. In most of the affected forests, it designated certain areas as habitat reserve and other areas that remained open to logging. The Sayus Law, however, was a different story. In addition to older forest reserves, the plan designated wide buffer zones along all streams with salmon. Since the Sayus Law had an extraordinarily high density of salmon-bearing streams, almost none of the forest could be managed for timber. They had just cut the guts out of most of the timber that had been available historically on the Sayus Law National Forest. I didn't have a sense of where we were going to go from there. Here, because it was the whole thing, it forced us to think differently about the whole thing. And today, we are looking less at these are reserves that are hands off. And then here we're going to go manage for commodities. Instead, we're looking at the whole ecosystem across the whole watershed yeah. and saying, how can we manage this watershed in a way that will restore and sustain ecological processes and functions? One of Furnish's most immediate concerns in the early 90s was the road system. This was a Cadillac road system we had on this forest. It was the most unbelievably grand road system I've seen on any landscape, uh, but it cost a lot to build and maintain. With timber sale receipts almost non-existent, the road maintenance budget fell precipitously. I began to fear the impact of a major storm on a relatively unmaintained road system, and that was what was going to happen. So, with a limited budget, they started to take steps to reduce the risk presented by roads. Actually started doing some of our early water barring, trying to neutralize the roads, make them more benign on the landscape, really around the summer of 94. So we had some experience in that of a couple summers of activity before the big storm hit that was the subject of Torrents of Change, the winter of 1996. It was a big storm event and really hit almost the entire coast range. The consequence was that we, like almost every other landowner, lost a lot of our road system. When they heard the storm was coming, Forest Service scientist Gordon Grant and Fred Swanson went to the Andrews Experimental Forest in Oregon's Cascade, barely making it in before the roads closed. They wanted to observe the storm firsthand and shoot video of its impact. Four months later, they led a scientific team back to the Andrews to study the storm's effects. This study was a central focus of the documentary, Torrents of Change. So here's a little innocuous ephemeral channel. Water came down, kept going across the road tread. Some of it spilled over this side, created a gully. Grant continues to work for the Forest Service today. Following the 96 storm, we found ourselves referring to it as a test. The test was of both the resilience of the landscape as a whole in response to a big, albeit not unpredictable, climatic event, and also a test of the way we had chosen at that time to manage the landscape. When they compared the effects of the 96 storm with earlier storms in the Andrews Forest, their data demonstrated that road building and clear cutting in mountainous landscapes increased the frequency and severity of landslides and impacts on fish bearing streams. Another natural test had taken place where the storm first hit the coast in the Sayus Law. We had already had a couple of years of determining that certain roads were no longer necessary for our future. Others were, some of these roads had been treated with water barring, culvert removals, spill removals, that kind of thing, and others had not. We very quickly developed a paired study where we analyzed the storm effect on the roads that had been managed to reduce their liability and those that had not. 
and we found marked differences. The frequency and magnitude, intensity of the landslides were much worse on our open road system than they were on the road system that we had quieted down. And so we had, in many ways, that perfect storm, the right guy in the right place, mm -hmm. the natural event that was the learning opportunity, and a story of how management had changed and was adapting. I knew you didn't like a lot of things the Forest Service was doing, and you were very vocal as an individual and as an organization about that. And so I had said, what are you gonna do when you catch us doing something good? I felt this video was, I caught you doing something good, I'm with you. I will stand up and say it. We are for environmental ethics when we see the Forest Service doing something that we think comports with sound land management that displays an environmental ethic, we will say so. And I want to be part of that. And I'll tell you, that's a heck of a lot more fun than just throwing rocks. And it's the way that you actually do make real change. As people increasingly take the long view of how forests change and evolve and can be influenced by human actions and such, that same long view translates into the social processes as well. And when you have a social process, and a, a conversation that, that has the long view as a framework, that seems to me to open up the door to a different kind of conversation. As long as your basic mission is wrong, it's very hard for there to be peace. I think what the Northwest Forest Plan did that was create a new sense of right that then people could begin to gather around and build on. Especially on the Sayus Law, where the Northwest Forest Plan awarded, if you want to think about it that way, complete victory to one side, it ended that fight. And that created space for a new conversation. Ernest and the Sayus Law staff were confronted with a choice. Since nearly the entire forest was designated as reserve, they could have chosen the easy path and done nothing. It wasn't entirely a foregone conclusion that we'd end up as a restoration forest, though. No. Some of the thinking behind the Northwest Forest Plan was that we would be a preserve in which no action took place. And so I think, in part, what you did was to give people a way forward, to give people hope of becoming something that we could find a way to do and add value. And there was a choice point there. We could fight the old fight, we could give up and go home, or we could find a new way. They chose to find a new way. One of the key elements was the coming together of people in the Watershed Council format and tossing out ideas of what would make life better for everybody here. And then there was the willingness of the government to say to both sides, you got an idea? how we can solve this, put up or shut up. Stop throwing rocks from the outside, come in, sit at the table, and we started these stakeholder interest group round table type of, of activities. The conflicts are minimal at this point. I think one of the real strong suits of the collaboration here in this ICE law is that we don't dwell on those differences and try to focus on the common ground. That said, sometimes you have to address them. And I would say because of the years of working together, that's become a lot easier. In the mid-90s, the watershed council began to develop, and I got on board with that. And in fact, I, I remember saying just in this first year when they were established, I, I will not sit at the same table with the timber industry. I absolutely cannot. But I did. And it was a great learning experience. We had one common goal that we would talk about, lots of things we would not talk about. But we could all talk about the restoration of salmon. From the earliest cooperative efforts to the wide spectrum of collaborative activities on the Sayus Law today, salmon have served as the central icon of the community's shared purpose, and the restoration of this once magnificent resource as their common goal. A huge role of the Watershed Council is bringing together the different stakeholders, the different views, the different perspectives, the different values. The Sayus Law Watershed Council is coordinating this project, where a stream traverses a fertile floodplain near the coast. The coastal lake systems are some of the most productive coastal streams in the Northwest. 
This valley bottom stream connects the headwaters on national forest lands with the estuary and the sea and has tremendous value as habitat for coho salmon. There was about 30% or a third of the stream length was gone due to straightening and pushing the stream over to the side of the valley. When you do that to a stream, it really hurts the fish habitat in that stream by shortening the distance of the stream, which increases the gradient. And, and if you don't let it spill out on the floodplain to dissipate its energy, it just down cuts. And that's what happened here. The Forest Service was able to acquire the land through a federal conservation fund. Here, they're digging a new meandering path to reconnect the stream with its natural floodplain. The Watershed Council coordinates the planning and performance of this and other restoration activities among several partner organizations. A good portion of what I do is facilitating those conversations and making those connections amongst people and letting them do what they're really good at, which is speaking about their interests. Watershed Councils are run on consensus. And that was a learning process for me too. Instead of going head to head, saying I will never sit down and talk about this with you. For consensus, you had to have everybody on board. But everybody talks. If somebody is strongly opposed, they can step aside after they've had a chance to talk about it with everybody and recognize perhaps their viewpoint is not the most important thing we want to achieve a certain end. That was a great learning experience for me, behaviorally. It is remarkable, the distance that's been covered. People putting aside past differences and being willing to come to the table, even if it was skeptical at first, which we certainly were, and maybe we could work together and find some common ground. It was a risk, I think probably for everybody, but we've seen that it is possible and it's been great progress. We're right now harvesting a 35 to 40 year old stand that was running probably close to 300 to 400 trees an acre when we started. We're cutting it down to about 70 to 80 trees to the acre. This type of timber is what the mills are looking for and what everybody's geared up to process this day and age. Intensive industrial forestry didn't begin on the Sayus Law until after World War II. In the decades that followed, much of the natural forest was clear-cut, then densely replanted with monocultures of Douglas fir. I was concerned about the future of those young forests with respect to the aims of the Northwest Forest Plan. It's quiet here. I don't hear the bird diversity that I heard in the forests that have been dimmed. I had some serious doubts as to whether stands that have been created like that were ever going to really attain the overall structure that we were looking at. They began to experiment with thinning methods that might restore old growth characteristics more quickly. This stand was one of the original thins, completed around 1994. This stand was thinned about a year ago. Some of those lower branches that today are fairly small yeah. will develop out into great big branches, start building platforms for marble mural. This stand is being thinned today. They hope to accelerate the development of critical habitat for hundreds of species of animals and plants. You keep some bigger trees, some smaller trees, leave little areas a little thicker, a little bit thinner in other areas, so it's not a perfectly even stand. Modern logging methods minimize damage to the forest and make the most efficient use of the wood. This operation here of just what we produce is 10 truck driving jobs, nine ground personnel, and plus a couple office staff just with one yarder operation going on. So you're looking at a huge economic benefit for all the community. The benefits to the forest and the local economy are just the beginning. Most of the revenue generated by thinning on the Sayus Law is spent directly on restoration of watersheds, streams, and salmon. The decisions on how it's spent are made through local stewardship groups. These are not formally chartered and appointed groups. These are simply open sessions in which anybody can come and speak and has a voice. And they really determine in an all but legal sense, how the funds that are collected from these 
timber sales are spent. Importantly, while 60% goes toward restoration on national forest lands, 40% supports projects on other ownerships that have an impact on the life cycle of salmon. The salmon don't know whose road it is, who's blocking passage. They need to be able to get all the way up. We're able to manage, to a certain degree, the entire watershed through a system of collaboration and mutual incentives. Not by regulation, but by working together. Working together at a watershed level across ownership boundaries enables them to influence the entire freshwater life cycle of salmon. If we're to be successful, we've got to manage recovery of salmon across the entire watershed. Now in the Sayus Swamp, where most of the streams run directly to the ocean, we can look at the whole watershed from the headwaters all the way to the sea, and it's not all national forest. But it's all within the scope of a watershed council. It's all within the scope of a stewardship group. Because there's a number of tributaries, all of them have some money benefits, and there's tributaries on Forest Service land that we're trying to influence. We do work outside the Forest Service boundaries with timber receipts for money from the thinning, and we get to use the expertise from the Forest Service to help us work on these projects. It's an awesome story, and it's an awesome transition for individuals, for an agency, and for communities. Much of the story still involves the remaining road system. I can see where the uh, road goes on uh, on the other side over there. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the contracts did a good job of recontouring. This road was recently decommissioned. We're only, what, 100 yards upstream of Five Rivers here, and that's a Chinook and Coho stream? Correct, so it was pretty critical that we make sure that we get these stabilized in addition to decommissioning roads and removing culverts, replacing culverts on existing roads is a high priority. The culvert that we took out of here was about five feet in diameter. This pipe is about 14 feet in diameter and is designed to have a simulated stream go all the way through. When we first started doing fish passage culvert replacements, we were doing them at a smaller scale, primarily just to move adult salmon up past the barricades that they couldn't get past anymore. And in the 15 or 20 years we've been doing this, the technology has evolved, and we're now doing what we call aquatic organism passage culverts, and they're meant to freely pass up and down the stream all ages of fish and other aquatic organisms, salamanders and even macroinvertebrates, so that it's like a complete stream through it. They've evolved a virtuous circle in the Sayus Lion's surrounding lands that benefits the people, the forest, and salmon. Building young plantations accelerates their evolution into old growth, generating timber, money, and jobs. This funds multiple restoration activities, decommissioning roads that are no longer needed, maintaining the existing road network to minimize impacts on streams, replacing culverts that block the passage of fish, and restoring the physical and biological functions of watersheds and streams. Two decades after embarking on a radically new mission, are they succeeding? Another natural test came in January of 2012. A major storm again hit the central Oregon coast causing massive flooding in the Sayusla and surrounding lands. We had a couple of road failures, they were small. The roads that we had put in storage, the culverts that we'd upsized and replaced, all of those held up. The couple of small failures we had were on roads that we hadn't got to yet. Those kinds of checks are necessary from a scientific standpoint to know that you're doing the right thing. The 2012 storm demonstrated that the last two decades of watershed restoration had worked, so they contacted the local media. We called up some people and said, there was a big storm and our roads didn't wash out. They said, well, the image of a big road washout, that's an image I can use. The image of a road not washed out, it doesn't look like news. How do we tell that story? The story from my side is that we've got a transition that's positive. In these days, we need positive stories where we've got communities working with federal, working with state, and actually trying to move a landscape in the right direction. To me, that's a pretty significant story. 
It's a story of a forest that really itself took the initiative among the staff who worked there and said, okay, what do we stand for? What are we going to stand for into the future? What is our mission going to be? And that's an exercise, that's a discussion that every national force should go through. And the CISA staked out a message, and it was a mission of restoration, of fish, of wildlife, and of recreation. Mm -hmm. And it was transformational. And it ended up being embraced by everyone who works there. And people have pride in what they do on this national forest today. Most of our Forest Service employees spend most of their time working on projects that are improving the health of the land, that are widely supported in the community, and where they can spend their time actually engaging in designing and implementing the projects in the field and the projects come to fruition. The path they chose to take over 20 years earlier enabled the CITUS law to achieve a fundamental and effective transformation. Here, for a variety of reasons, including leadership, but also including circumstance, we were able to make a fairly dramatic shift that has proven powerful and lasting. Mm -hmm. Part of the shift is letting science lead the way. So we used to pull the trees out of the stream to improve the conditions of water flow, yeah. to make sure that there were no barriers to fish migration. Yeah. Make it easier on the fish. Make it easier. <laughs> now we put the trees back in the stream to create habitat for the fish. Part of the shift is including everyone's voice in a fair and open way. If you're going to have an initiative, if you're going to have a discussion over fish or forest, you've got to invite everybody that might possibly have an interest. So that later on, if they don't show up and you come up with a plan, you come up with a program, you come up with a solution, and they weren't there, they can't say, I didn't have anything to do with that. And you say, yeah, we know. But then we invite you. It takes all of us, I think, working together, maybe pushing, pushing a few buttons, you know, making some people uncomfortable. And I think we need that. Despite the differences that remained, they were able to find a powerful shared purpose, a common goal. And their efforts are paying off. Some sites lost streams have seen a five-fold increase in returning coho salmon. Finally, there's a shift in how we consider the effects of our actions today on the fate of future generations. We are dealing with a huge landscape, so what we're doing is so important for the future. We can't just be satisfied with what we're doing now. We have to be asking questions, and we have to ask ourselves why the questions. At the time the Northwest Forest Plan was announced, I think it felt to people like they had lost something. And yeah, I think 20 years later, we can look back and say that that was a gift. I wasn't feeling much like it was a gift. I think by the time I left the CITES Law in 99, I, I was beginning to sense more of the gift quality of the Northwest Forest Plan because it had challenged us to really think anew about how we manage land and what our responsibilities were. And I, I began to feel like, oh, we're getting this right. My biggest concern, I know, in 99, after walking it out for a few years, was whether it was durable as a model and sustainable. And that's always managing any organization. Renewing, sustaining, keeping the vision alive becomes a key part of how we renew ourselves, how we move forward. Now, I think the legacy that Jim and the staff from there left has been carried on, has been renewed, We'll continue to face challenges in the future. We can't do these plantations forever. We will eventually have to, once again, renew ourselves and become something different. And yet the trust, the relationships, the inspiration that we find in what we're doing today should give us space in which to have those conversations in a collaborative environment and give us the way to create whatever we have to become in the future. I hope that people can be able to sit right here a hundred years from now and say, look at this. It's so much better than it was a hundred years ago. That'd be my dream.
engaged the Audubon Sanctuary, and I think I'm just supposed to say a few words, you know. So before we pass it over to Jim and let him talk about his book, okay? So, so the few things that I'd like to talk about is this issue of transition. Most folks probably aren't aware that if we look back in time, just north of, just north of here, there was a whole bunch of workers, about 2,000 workers, forest workers, fallers, choker setters, logging this logic track over here. That's a thing of the past. The fight that Jim was in the middle of, or before Jim came to the Sayus Club, there was a fight. I was an evil character, I hate to say that, in Forehead uh, Corvallis. Because <coughs> I was talking about protection and restoration before you could really say it out loud. You know? And we've got a lot of work ahead of us still, recovery of these systems. Most folks don't like to talk about the Clean Water Act. A lot of us do like to talk about the Clean Water Act. Because my dad kind of instilled in me that you should be able to swim in your local river and eat the fish out of that local river. That's a radical thought, though, for some folks, because that means other folks have to change. Industries need to change. Larger buffers, protect unstable slopes, bigger buffers on every trip, tributary. So those are things. That's a transition that we're in the middle of right now. It's an interesting point in time that we're at. And this transition that I personally made and the Cytus One National Forest has made is very exciting because, like I said before, it wasn't like I was welcomed in the district office because I was talking about protection and restoration, but now this transition is very real. We do joint projects together. We don't even blink at $100,000 or $200,000 joint projects, <coughs> working on Forest Service land and on private land downstream. Unprecedented. No one would have predicted that that could happen. And it's happening around the whole site as well. So I feel so fortunate to be where we are right now in this ISL at this point in time, seeing that we almost, we had coho almost flatlined. 20,000 fish coastwide, 20,000 fish coastwide. When we showed up 150 years ago, it was 1.8 million. So we almost flatlined them. And now we've got a healthy, a, on the verge of a healthy 300,000 fish coming back. It's good news, it's good news. And so uh, these are things that there's been a commitment by the agency, ODFW, the Forest Service, and a lot of private individuals on public and private land, downstream from public land. So there's a lot of opportunity. When this was all in play, the folks down in the Sayers Club created a watershed council. We created one here 20 years ago. We just celebrated it. 20 years ago of us working on private land <coughs> downstream from Forest Service land. As these little watershed groups started, there were only a handful back then. There's 300 around the region now. And they're all dealing with how can I make sure that we have cold, clean water in these rivers for salmon and for the next generation? So it's a legacy for us. So in any event, I think that's all I'm gonna really say. Any of you who are interested in any doing any work on your land, I work with the Watershed Council and on joint projects with the, through the stewardship process, we can make the project happen if you're interested. So Jim, I'd like to have you, thank you, this is really good. So he's going to, I think, read a little bit from the book, right? Yeah. Excellent. He's, he's an amazing guy, and I know that he is uh, not alone in this part of Oregon. So I thank all of you kindred spirits who have uh, who just worked to help make what you saw tonight a reality. Um, so yeah, I want to walk through this book a little bit with you. And I'm going to start with the preface because I want to create a little context. 
for what follows. And then I want to jump ahead uh, toward the latter part of the book. It really gets to this part of the career that was spent in your neck of the woods. I chose to spend our U.S. Bicentennial, July 4th, 1976, backpacking Colorado's Never Summer Mountains, which form Rocky Mountain National Park's western border. Remnant ice at midsummer on Lake of the Clouds was a reminder of the long winters and brief summers in the high peaks. The lake's cobalt water slowly emerged from a long slumber with an ice shelf hugging the western shore. As I ambled through the alpine high country above Timberline, enjoying the freedom of being small in big country, a faint tinkling sound caught my ear. I approached the margin where open water and ice met and discovered the source of the sound. Waves from an afternoon breeze roughening the water lapped against the edge of the ice, gently separated long daggers of ice that danced and bumped in the water. Each icicle a chime now, they numbered in the thousands. From the waters emanated a sublime symphony of tinkling bells, delicate and magnificent. This was simply exquisite. Winter lost its grip, and the ice did too, breaking up as it slowly disappeared. But the loss of ice was accompanied by the gain of something beautiful. With nature, this miracle of death and rebirth happens every year, part of nature's cycle, comforting in its regularity. Human endeavors also confront change, but are often accompanied with grief and stress instead of comfort. So it was with the breakup of the Forest Service's old order. The Forest Service of the 1950s was heavily populated with men of righteous zeal, winners of the Great War, the kind described by Tom Brokaw in The Greatest Generation. They aimed to log national forests aggressively for a wood-hungry nation. By the late 1960s, the Forest Service was engaged in a battle for the soul of public lands in a decades-long slow-motion collision with a robust and rising environmental movement. <clears throat> now I'm going to jump ahead to the Sayus Law. This was about December 1991. Snails, as they make their way to wherever they're going, proceed slowly with the antenna extended. If they touch anything, the antenna will recoil quickly. Now, I can feel my antenna fully extend when I'm beginning a new job. I'm very sensitive to clues like office decor, clothing, facial expressions, friendliness of coworkers as I try to feel the vibe. Every office has a culture, a unique personality. The Sayus Law culture quickly struck me as sober, very competent, and also a bit beleaguered. We had outstanding professionals in most every staff group, but cheerful? No. Interest groups contested almost everything we did. I wanted to get into the woods right away to see examples of Oregon's coast range forestry. This would help me get grounded as to how the Sayus Law did things. <clears throat> I asked the timber staff officer, Dale Ratman, to give me a look-see at what the Sayusla had going on with the new forestry I'd been hearing so much about in presentations back in Washington, D.C. Some field foresters, I heard, were trying to apply some of the research Chris Mazur had described by doing dirty clear cuts, so-called because instead of the clean antiseptic look of a forest stand where all trees, even dead ones, were cut down, these clear cuts had numerous live and dead trees left for wildlife, stream protection, visual diversity. Big, dog, big dead logs on the ground stayed put, too. Redman kind of smiled and said, not really into that. Uh, so I don't have anything to show you. I asked him if we could at least look at some timber sales in the planning stages that intended to apply new forestry principles. Nope. This is the Sayus Law. We clear cut here. A bit puzzled, I tried to discern the attitude at work in this place. I didn't sense any embarrassment, or guilt, <coughs> or even mild shame. No, it seemed more to be pride, perhaps even a touch of arrogance. No need to waste time on a passing fad. <clears throat> so here's some, here's some circumstance that we talked about in the video that drives change. 
1991, a ruling from Federal District Judge William Dwyer stopped the Forest Service from cutting timber from forests inhabited by the Northern Spotted Owl. The injunction clapped the clamped the jugular of federal timber in the Pacific Northwest, sent a deep shudder through the agencies and the timber industry that depended on these forest lands for raw material. The end had finally come to the decades-long liquidation of the remaining old-growth forests. It had the feeling of a meat locker, the door clunking shut behind you, and then hearing a bolt slide it in place. Judge Dwyer had spoken. The good old days were gone forever. Prior to Judge Dwyer's ruling, the Forest Service had inexorably, incrementally sought to tame the vast and valuable forests of the Pacific Northwest. Aggressive logging of public land rested on a foundation of the growing nation's demand for wood, and the nation trusted the Forest Service as long as its policies seemed consistent with public values. But public values can change and distrust grow. Following the war in Vietnam, the new generation viewed government with increasing skepticism and cynicism. Fewer and fewer people accepted sweeping vistas dominated by clear cuts and new roads. Instead, they valued naturalness, clean water, abundant fish, wildlife, and a deep sense of connection with the land. They were anguished at what the Forest Service was taking from the Forest Service at the expense of future generations. You can plant all the trees you want, but you can't make a forest. That's God's business. <clears throat> I can see that the policies and actions of these leaders laid bare a deep schism between the past and the future. Forest management as it had been done and what it needed to become. The goal for decades had been to maintain the annual timber harvest total for all national forests at 11, about 11 billion board feet in the United States. Thus, Forest Service leaders um, managed owl issues to minimize the disruption of timber production. Timber harvest became even more important than legally required protection of the owl and other wildlife. The lawsuit that Dwyer decided successfully demonstrated that this policy was both illegitimate and illegal. A different approach was needed. The same schism evidenced itself throughout the nation at the field level. Sayusma managers issued their forest plan in 1990, just before I arrived, having taken almost 10 years to complete the effort. The scientific basis for protecting the owl had started with researcher Eric Forsman. Do they know Eric? He's older and wiser now. <laughs> He'd become interested in the owl after observing them in the Corvallis watershed, which lies along the eastern fringe of the Sayusla National Forest and is a source of drinking water for Corvallis. Eric described the critical link between late successional forest, also called old growth, and the owl habitat needs. Eliminate old growth forest, his research suggested, and you eliminate owls. In 1987, the Forest Service hired Eric as a research biologist at the Corvallis Forest Sciences Lab. If his research had an embedded message for the Forest Service and its timber management practices, one would think it would have been heard most clearly in Corvallis. Yet dedicated adherence to timber production marked the 15-year period between 76, when he began researching Al, and Judge Dwyer's judgment in 1991 both on the Sayusla National Forest and throughout the Pacific Northwest. The Sayusla released their forest plan just prior to Dwyer's injunction. The owl controversy had become quite hot. The plan established an allowable timber sale quantity of about 215 million board feet, a reduction from the 320 level throughout the 1980s. Many thousands of jobs, billions of timber dollars hung in the balance. Although the owl issue had already begun to threaten national timber policy and harvest levels, the Sayusla law plan made a very clear statement that timber occupied the seat of highest priority, and that clear-cutting of mature timber would continue. Minimal measures, the least possible, would be taken to protect the owl. And numerous other plans for national forests and owl habitat followed the same thinking as the Sayus laws. The Forest Service was doubling down on its bet.
In sum, the plan standards and our experience with its habitat protection provisions made it clear that any further pursuit of clear cutting in mature stands in the Sayuse Laws matrix would pr prove fruitless. And I regarded the Northwest Forest Plan as an explicit admission that this incredibly productive landscape could not simultaneously maximize both wood products and wildlife. The forest was the womb that sustained this natural abundance, and the Northwest Forest Plan made the hard choice for federal land. The remaining mature forest in the Coast Range would stay standing. <clears throat> now, a couple years after I got here, I remember being at a conference up in Salishan, and I was asked to give a speech. I was serving on a panel, which included Bart Starker. I don't know if you know any of Starker industry. Folks, and I was sitting right next to Bart. And um, I, get, I think at that time it was like a seven minute talk. And um, by the time that seven minutes over, things changed. In 1994, just after the release of the plan, the Northwest Plan, I delivered a speech to the public and agency employees. I titled it, Uncle, Thank You, Please. The speech sent a message to the public and agency employees that the Northwest Forest Plan openly admitted a need for change. Uncle. That we owed a debt to environmentalists for their passionate insistence on principles of sustainable stewardship. Thank you. And that we needed time and patience to perform up to new expectations. Please. The speech enhanced the willingness of environmentalists to allow Sayus Law leadership some latitude to demonstrate our sincerity and commitment to change. High Country News, anybody read that? High Country News, a bi-weekly newspaper for people who care about the West, uh, requested my permission to reprint the speech, and I, get, I gladly consented. They were well respected and widely read, offered a huge media footprint for people uh, who cared about national forest issues. Um, we quickly adapted Sayus Law timber sale programs to rely almost entirely on young stand thinning, the residue of the clear-cut era. And in addition, we pioneered many simplified procedures to reduce costs, increase revenues. The Forest Service commonly uses some of these today in stewardship contracts. Looking back over those tumultuous times, I can identify one pivotal event, one pivotal event, that crystallized the moment our forest organization made the leap from the old to the new. Our leadership team was, this is like the, you know, me and the district rangers, like Connie Frisch was here in uh, Walport and other uh, staff officers in Corvallis. Our leadership team was in a rather heated discussion about where to go with our timber program. Uh, some were trying to persuade us to retain as much of our traditional activity to mature forests as possible, while others thought we should acknowledge that was a dead end. It was time to pursue thinning. We needed a decision. Well, I had heard enough. And my guts told me to take a stand. I said, we will no longer clear-cut mature timber on the same slope. We would devote all our energy to thinning plantations. This was our future for as far as I could see. And we had decades of this work before us. Now this, this story is a, an important anecdote, I think, because it really speaks to fish. And if you notice that fish were a, a unifying theme to a lot of our restoration. Um, I'm assuming some of you are familiar with the Enchanted Valley. This is up above Mercer Lake near Florence. Uh, one of uh, the very important and early fish restoration projects we undertook. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation had purchased Enchanted Valley in about 18, 1985. And then they brokered a deal transferring ownership of the property to the Forest Service in return for assurances that the valley would be managed for elk winter range. The Sayus Law Rod and Gun Club played a prominent role in hyping this deal. The formal cattle pasture became a tremendous elk habitat abetted by the Forest Service who mowed the uh, meadows every fall to keep the grass in a juvenile, uh, more edible condition to enhance its palatability for elk. 
Now, I can attest to the fact that the elk loved it because I saw them there almost every time I visited Enchanted Valley. And hunters enjoyed having a big local elk herd to afford the high quality hunting. Now, when we aired the idea of a fisheries restoration project in Enchanted Valley, uh, controversy gathered like iron filings to a magnet. Uh, Al Pern, a retired military officer and active member of the Sayus Law Rod and, Club, Rod and Gun Club, lived his dream on a hillside that sat directly above Enchanted Valley, uh, saying he represented the sentiments of the club. He let me know he viewed me and my ideas as a threat. How could the Forest Service, and more particularly <coughs> to me, uh, even consider ruining perfectly good elk range for the benefit of fish? Hadn't the Forest Service acquired the valley by virtue of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation's generosity, and the elk advocates strongly felt I violated the spirit of that deal? I also heard rumblings from the Forest Service's Mapleton staff that even they thought the proposal did not keep faith. Well, I thought I saw things differently. Uh, elk were not hurting in the coast range. Uh, salmon were in deep trouble. Our actions would slightly diminish both the quality and quantity of elk habitat once the streamside trees grew to large size, but would not eliminate it. Changes would occur slowly, giving the elk herd time to adapt. If the fisheries project worked, and we thought it could, though we could not guarantee it, the benefits to salmon would be huge, and we'd have a tested viable technique that could be applied in many other places. We held a meeting in Florence. Citizens had plenty to say, mostly opposing the fisheries project. They had heard the grapevine that even Forest Service opinions split between elk and salmon since many of our own employees were avid elk hunters. Al Pern poked his finger in my chest, literally, saying he would show me how democracy worked. Uh, not surprisingly, no consensus emerged. And I ultimately decided to do the Enchanted Valley Project after careful consideration of dissenting views. The uh, Rod and Gun Club appealed my decision, but on review, the Regional Forester in Portland supported me. We pulled the money together, issued contracts, the dirt flew. The transformation of Bailey Creek was rapid and dramatic. The new stream bed emerged from the construction phase and vegetation quickly healed the raw spots. The day came to cut the water loose into the new channel an event welcomed with nervous anticipation. Bailey Creek performed like a perfect gentleman, water easing into the channel, slowly sauntering toward Mercer Lake. The creek embraced its new course as if returning to haunts of its youth. Then the fish did their job. Salmon returned to spawn, and the new channel proved a happy home. It takes three to four years for salmon smolts to head for the ocean, mature, and return as adults to spawn. The first year those spawning adults returned to Bailey Creek, their numbers had increased by tenfold. And succeeding years have continued to strengthen the population. Bailey Creek is not a small, but high quality salmon stream, and the elk, they're still there. Consider this. A hundred years ago, the Sayuslaw National Forest was a recently burned over young forest of seemingly little value. With time, this prodigiously productive thousand square mile landscape grew a phenomenal forest that exceeds $10 billion in timber value alone, even after removing several billion dollars worth. No wonder there is still such intense debate about which values will dominate the future. But land and resources do recover these federal forests generated many billions of dollars in profits. Aren't they worth an investment now in restoration? Public forests now focus strongly on wildlife and fish, clean water, recreation and naturalness by virtue of law and public preference. Timber management philosophy is moving toward sustaining ecosystems rather than producing revenue. Restoring health and vibrancy and productivity of these lands requires work. It's a different sort of work than previously known. The Pacific Northwest, indeed all of the U.S., is blessed to have a balance of both public and private forests. Private forests still primarily driven by economic forces. Public forests should not be. This diversity of forest ownership is healthy because it fosters a more diverse economy. Private forests are managed more for commerce, while public forests increasingly are managed more environmentally. 
Since I left the Sayus Law in 1999, several forest supervisors have succeeded me, all chose to adhere to the Sayus Law model. Annual thinning treatments have increased the stabilized timber harvest at about 40 million board feet. Ironically, the Sayus Law now sells more timber than most national forests in Oregon and Washington. Fisheries re restoration abounds in key watersheds through effective collaborative efforts. The Sayus Law pushes forward many strong support and no controversy. The environmental community now endorses the Sayus Law's embrace of forest restoration principles and pleads. Why can't more national forests be managed this way? I have just a couple more things I want to share with you. Kind of moving on from the, uh, the Sayus Law particularly. This is a really a poignant story for me because this was my first summer uh, working for the Forest Service on uh, the Tiller Ranger District on the Elk National Forest in 1965. When I arrived there for my first job, I met my boss for the summer, Owen Downhill. Junior, who lived in a small house on the Forest Service compound with his wife and young kids. Owen very graciously cared for us, his young, inexperienced crew, while we learned the ropes. I had no car, so I walked around town. It was not a big town. Uh, to the two big attractions, Ruth Mount's 42 Cafe and Porter's Grocery Store slash Post Office. Well, Owen knew I loved to fish, so he took me to Squaw <laughs> one of his favorite spots. And early on a Saturday, we followed the South Oak Claw up river to its confluence with Jackson Creek. Then passing near the world's largest sugar pine, took a logging road a few miles further southeast, headed higher into the mountains. We parked on the shoulder of the road in a fresh clear-cut unit. Heading straight downhill, crazy steep, we followed a crude fire break built by a dozer. Charred logs lay scattered about from the Forest Service burned the clear-cut to get rid of logging debris so it could be planted more easily. It was sunny, it was hot. We quickly reached Squaw Creek, no more than 10 feet wide, tumbling down through giant trees, a never-ending series of crystal clear pools amid the boulder-strewn channel. Native cutthroat trout awaited us. Lost in reverie, we fished for hours, leapfrogging our way slowly in a gentlemanly fashion, making small talk occasionally. We caught and released seven to 11 inch trout, too numerous to count, each one beautiful, and in a humans as novelty way, quick to grab even the most sloppily presented fly. What a great day. We sweated buckets on a trudge uphill to the car, a small price to pay. 30 years later, I met Jeff Dose, a fisheries biologist for the Umpqua at a Forest Service meeting. Now Jeff had gotten crosswise with his boss because he'd gone rogue speaking openly and publicly of his view that timber harvesting ruins stream health and fisheries. This earned him much scorn from agency regulars, kudos from the environmental community, who knew there was abundant evidence of environmental trouble if they could only find it. And Dose's outspokenness fueled suspicion that plenty more dirt lay in other unseen corners. I thought, yeah, I thought Jeff had guts, putting his principles in front of job security. <coughs> Uh, curious about the cutthroat trout up in Squaw Creek, I shared my recollections fishing there in 65. He listened to me intently, and then he said, they're all gone now. I, I just didn't want to, uh, I just didn't want to believe him. I, I couldn't believe him. You know, I'd even entertain thoughts of going back there to relive that wonderful experience. And uh, I just thought, I, I need some reassurance and maybe he misunderstood. So I pressed the point, uh, you know, that this uh, particular Squaw Creek was the one that emptied into Jackson Creek. Uh, and he interjected, I, I know, I know. They're all gone. Now, uh, in a Santa County almanac, uh, Eldo Leopold spoke to the larger issue that Squaw Creek represents. Do we not already sing our love for and obligation to the land of the free and the home of the brave? Yes, but just what and whom do we love? 
Certainly not the soil, which we are sending helter-skelter downriver. Certainly not the animals, of which we have already extirpated many of the largest and most beautiful species. A land ethic changes the role of homeo, homeo sapien from conqueror of the land community to a plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for his fellow members and also respect for the community as such. Aldo Leopold paid attention to his world. He exercised a simple virtue of observation and interpretation. He loved the earth and came to dislike and distrust the way humans treated it. Now let's recall that the conservation movement and the Forest Service itself were born from intentional, principled leadership. President Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, the first Forest Service chief, saw environmental abuse and did something about it, even though their actions were unpopular at the time. Both men crawled around on the floor of the White House, marking future national forests on maps. And then by executive order, Teddy Roosevelt created the bulk of our existing national forest lands to beat a midnight deadline imposed by Congress to rescind his authority. The vision of Pinchot and Roosevelt on their hands and knees seems almost comical, but it demonstrates their serious intentions. The problem now is that the Forest Service's intentions for the next century and beyond are unclear. They need to be made clear if the agency is to excel. The first thing Forest Service leaders need to say loudly to internal and external audience is that both public sentiment and science have shown that former management principles for our national forests are no longer valid. We tried the timber as king approach and it failed. Restoration will be necessary and will be an ongoing priority. Now this can be done without repudiating former leaders and their motives. Next, the agency's leaders need to explicitly embrace the mandate of ecosystem management, which I would describe as value-driven resource management with the goal of maintaining or achieving naturalness. Primary values should be clean water and air, abundant fish and wildlife, quality recreation opportunities, and sustaining landscape function. And next, they need to take actions that are consistent with this ecosystem management mandate. They need to make it clear that while commercial activity is essential, maintaining environmental integrity is paramount. And they need to proceed with a sense of urgency. Leaders of the Forest Service today have the latitude and the authority to create change. That's what society expects of leaders. I say to them, don't squander the privilege and responsibility of leadership. Make a choice. Embrace it enthusiastically. Commit fully to creating a new reality and paradigm. If they do these things, the benefits will redound globally to other forests and those who manage them. The finest tradition of American excellence calls for us to initiate change when the conditions warrant and then take bold action. The world waits for leaders to step out without apology to create a different future, create hope again and again and again. To the Forest Service I served and loved and had to leave, I implore you, do it now. Thank you. talk or buy books or whatever, but I wanted Paul to come up now and kind of moderate a discussion uh, between us and you folks. Great. So, you know, there's another player in the community here. Where's my logo? Dave? Okay. We've got some, another person who probably could help us answer questions. So, if you're, inter if you're willing, Dave Eisler, come on up. You'll recognize him from the video. He's over the ridge, over the next ridge, and the next ridge. That's where Dave is. I am over the hill. Yes. <laughs> he might be able to help us answer questions. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, see if there are any questions from the audience. Back in the back. Uh, first, thank you for your contribution. Uh, my question.
question is this, what are your concerns now? Okay. Uh, we had an event similar to this in Corvallis last night. That very same question came up. I couldn't make it over there. Uh, I was hoping to go over there. So thank you. Um, I mentioned um, carbon. Uh, you know, the world's forests are a tremendous uh, reservoir of carbon storage. And uh, with climate change, all those issues, the, the role of forests in dealing with carbon, atmospheric, CO2, climate change, all this kind of thing is, is huge. And our national forests are, are a tremendous treasure chest of forest carbon. I believe that uh, they can be managed so as to maintain and actually improve uh, carbon storage. Uh, I see that as a, a very big looming issue and one that is largely untouched in terms of policy considerations about what to do about that. Uh, Chandra Le Gui, who you might remember from the uh, video, I want to give her credit because she also spoke and she said water. Uh, now I know you had a dry spell, it was raining today, um, but if you've been watching what's going on in California particularly, and I was watching a kind of weather scroll for the last like 60 days, and it was just amazing the way everything was just like going around California. Um, and I know even here in Oregon, the, your snowpack up in the Cascades is a lot smaller than usual. Uh, water is such a critical resource, and the role of forests in provisioning society for clean, abundant water is, is absolutely crucial. The, the, uh, the tandem nature of climate change and, and water issues, uh, I would say, are huge challenges for society in the near future. Uh, those are two that I would quickly name. Um, and you anticipate my thoughts. <laughs> I, I think, well, first of all, thank you for your vision. It's affected all of us uh, so profoundly. <clears throat> but in the nature of the thinning, I guess there's a question that comes up, where to now? We've done it 20 years. We're gonna to continue to do it in the future. It's wonderfully successful. But I think being humble and understanding that we don't understand so much, um, there are a lot of impacts and questions surrounding thinning. Um, we know there are changes to biotic populations. We've we have the silvicultural trajectory down. We know it's going to take 100 years, 150 years to get to the old growth stands. We don't know the process and the biotic communities <clears throat> that will respond in different ways to thinning. I think, you know, for the Forest Service to be again on the forefront, um, they should be embracing the question of science and good science again. And there are a lot of researchers out there who are looking at uh, the impacts of uh, thinning. So my hope would be that, uh, you know, at some point, this discussion about um, biotic communities during this process of thinning is again embraced by the Forest Service. <coughs> as part of the good science, being on the frontier, asking these questions. Jim, you have a question? Yeah, how, how the, you want to say that louder? <laughs> how does the thinning regime supply the nitrogen which is lost by the older generation? The, the, the older, the, the uh, the natural uh, supply of nitrogen, which is which is uh, uh, brought on by the older generation. Um, I can't answer that in a deep way. I mean, I just confess I'm not, probably not technically qualified, um, but I do think there's enough inherent productivity in the soil that uh, these remnant clear cuts that have been thinned to to give the remaining trees a, a boost where they're going to grow rapidly to become old growth, and they're really not intended to be logged again until they've really achieved a, an older age. Um, and I, I believe that time is our ally in that process, that as these thin stands age for the next 100, 150 years, that 
that uh, restoration of some of the nitrogen and that kind of thing can, can be uh, restored. You're talking about thinning here. My question is, are you doing any replanting while you're doing the thinning? And so, what kind of trees are you replanting? Um, I'm not, I mean, I haven't been in the field on, in the Sayusla for quite a while. But I will tell you that, I mean, what we were starting to do, and what I think they're still continuing to do, is uh, some underplanting under to create diversity. Uh, in fact, in some places, we're actually planting alder uh, in the thinning stands. Uh, but they're also trying to introduce uh, species like cedar and uh, hemlock, uh, spruce, closer to the coast, which is kind of in its natural environs. And uh, to get away from the monoculture Douglas fir by introducing uh, diversity. But again, the idea is not to plant to great densities. So they're planting some trees, but not large numbers of them but with a diverse array. Maria? Yes, uh, when, when they do plant, <coughs> when you plant after thinning, and you're trying to restore the natural forest, uh, why not plant deciduous trees also, which would be the natural thing to have there. Why only conifers? Well, as I mentioned, uh, they actually have done some red alder. Um, a lot of deciduous, like if you know big maple, big leaf maple, tends to want to stay close to uh, stream courses, that kind of thing. In, in my experience in the uh, coast range, if you give deciduous trees a chance, they're, they're very quick to colonize uh, space. And uh, so they, they tend to take care of themselves pretty well. And uh, the idea when you open up a thin stand, if you open it up enough, then, man, I'll tell you, the, the forest floor just blossoms with all kinds of growth. But if you want things like cedar or hemlock or spruce, you, you have to plant. Okay, when you, that, the, may I ask that next question? Sure. Okay. When you plant those conifers, uh, how do you keep them from, uh, keep the competing, the vegetation around them from, you know, just not allowing them to grow, which is why they spray in the industrial forest. Yeah, how do you we, do that? Do we don't spray. Uh, okay. the, the U.S. Forest Service ceased spraying in the late 80s, and that was a result of a rather celebrated lawsuit loss. I, I, I realize that, but I was just curious what's happening when, when the replanting is done well, now. Is that is the vegetation cut by hand to allow Well, actually, we don't, we don't really need to. Uh, I think the idea is if you plant right when the uh, site is thin, the ground is really bare. Okay. And, and then they're, they're all starting from, from kind of an even uh, point. And, and those, those conifers do okay. I've come back 20 Great. years later, Great. And, and they're doing fine. They're so doing that's fine. also an example of what, how it should be done in, in the industrial forest, right? I tend to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hans? I think the scientific community pretty well uh, makes a point that uh, the old growth forests are a carbon sink and there's a value to it. Now the next step is how do we convince the standard population that we have a real asset there and, and in the future this <coughs> natural forest and old growth will be a real asset here. So how can, what can we do to convince people that over time, this is going to be a, a gold mine. Okay, well now, some of you might think based on what you've seen tonight that I'm a very upbeat, optimistic person. <laughs> and I, uh, I, I try to be, but even I despair sometimes. And I will tell you that I was asked in the last year 
to uh, work with Bob Doppelt and Ernie Neeming. These are names that some of you might know. And they actually created a federal forest carbon coalition, which was aimed at influencing federal land policy to try to enhance the priority of carbon in our forests. Um, pretty discouraging results. Uh, so, I mean, I have to say, we, we worked hard for the last year to move the needle with CEQ, Forest Service, BLM, Interior, Agriculture, and, and we didn't really make a great deal of progress. I think some of my feeling was that they seemed to have a somewhat self-satisfied attitude that they were already doing enough, uh, didn't really need any help or encouragement. Um, and, uh, but I will tell you that the other uh, barometer is how much, how much money can you attract to further the cause? And uh, regrettably, we were not very successful in raising additional monies to, to, to move that effort along beyond the initial seed grant. And, uh, and just in the last month, Bob Dobbell made the decision to bring it to a close. So the Federal Forest Carbon Coalition uh, shone brightly for about a year. And then, uh, now, we, we did some things, including giving the Forest Service a carbon report card. Um, and it was not uh, it was not an F, it was not an A, more like a C minus. Um, but uh, but I, I do think that's a, as I mentioned earlier in response to this one, I think this is a huge challenge, as well as an opportunity. We can do better, and we can we can sequester more carbon in our forests in the United States. I'm sorry I don't know all the details, but I do hear con uh, discussion about the Northwest Forest Plan now being modified to something different that allows supposedly great benefits for all, but I hear a lot of dissent from that opinion, and I'd like to know what your thought is about it. I've, I've been uh, a bit away from the vortex of the, the controversy surrounding the forest plan, and I, I hear rumblings about it, but I'm not explicitly very knowledgeable today. I would say that what's kind of interesting is um, we took, uh, on the site, so we took the Northwest Forest Plan very seriously, but we didn't, we didn't use it as a, a like a cooking recipe, you know, bang, bang, bang. We, we viewed it as a guide, and we actually kind of broke out of the box and, and did some things differently that I think were consistent with the spirit of the Northwest Forest Plan, if not exactly the letter of, uh, and, and I think, uh, I mean, I felt pretty good about that. that we took some chances. Um, and I don't think the Northwest Forest Plan was perfect. I thought it was really good. Uh, it really set the tone for a completely different way of looking at public land forest management. Um, but even I would argue that uh, all these kind of things need tinkering and tuning and improvement. And, um, but uh, man, I think, I think the Northwest Forest Plan, Forest Plan is mostly good. And I, I get a little alarmed at ideas of junking. Um, I just feel like uh, there's too much good in it uh, to, to throw it out. Uh, it really has radically altered public land management in the Pacific Northwest. And I might with mention, for example, Forest carbon. Uh, if you looked at the uh, all of the national forests in Oregon and Washington in 1990, they were emitting carbon. They were a carbon source in the atmosphere. Today, they're a profound carbon sink. 25 years later, these same forests, largely by a reduction of harvesting, have become a huge carbon sink. That's how much things can change in 25 years. I would actually like to help answer that question. So from my perspective, the Northwest Forest Plan probably was one of the best landscape conservation plans that had been put in place. But was it good enough? From my perspective, I'm willing to go ahead and say, if we're gonna look at the plan again, some of us call it Forest Plan 2.0, okay? And if we're serious about opening that back up, you would have to take into account this fact that Clean Water Act wasn't in the discussion back then. They had an aquatic conservation strategy in it, and eight options were developed, and then the ninth one 
was put on the table at the last minute, option nine. So from my perspective, if we actually embrace this concept of revisiting and using the best science for the Northwest Forest Plan under a 2.0 analysis, you'd end up saying, okay, let's revisit all nine options. Option one was the most conservative, and some of us wanted 1A, which would have been an aggressive land acquisition and actually implementing all of the restoration and protection measures in the plan. So even though ours was the best, there was still room for improvement if we were going to do it. So I think whether it's the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the list of options to actually create these large blocks of high quality habitat that would be on the landscape into the future. This is the legacy that we we want on the coast, if we're right. That leads to the actual gentleman's first question, what is the, what the large challenge in this issue of connectivity? We've got the Forest Service here doing another very positive thing. You may have heard about it, but probably not. It's an example of them acquiring land that goes from the ridge down to all the way to the estuary. Very thoughtful conservation planning. This issue of connectivity. It is part of the solution. And you can have private landowners in that connectivity strategy that are consistent with the goals of the Northwest Forest Plan. And you develop conservation easement strategies, conservation incentive strategies. All these things could be incorporated into the plan if we're serious. Okay, so that would be my take on where we could go if we're serious. Okay. Just to add to that, some of the discussions with the Forest Service that we've been having, I don't think the Northwest Forest Plan is gonna be changed across the landscape. It'll be potentially tailored to um, areas. So the Cygus Law may ask the question, do we even need to change it? So that's even a possibility. But across the board, uh, it's not gonna be a decision to change it for every group every, the same way. So I think that's possible. And, and one one of the on carbon markets, times change quickly. We're, with global warming, we can see the carbon market become very viable. It's market-based. It's all about the value. Yeah. Uh, now, I'm about to say something that distresses me, because I don't know about you, I'm having a great time. I, I, I love this. But I know that it's after nine, and we advertise this at 7.39. I'd like to take one more uh, question or comment, and I think we need to wind it down so that really people have permission to leave. Um, and then uh, I'm still gonna be over here at the table hanging around, you know, there's people hanging around chatter, that kind of and so on. So I'm getting, we have a young man here who I bet has a good question. Go ahead. Um, my question is, what percent of the trees at that they were before we started logging? Like, can you understand that? Yeah. Our native forest, what's left out there? Uh, well, see, I would bracket this by saying, as of about 1990, I think uh, of the Sayus laws, approximately 1,000 square miles about 40% had been clear cut. If that had continued until today, another 25 years since 1990, we'd probably be approaching 65 to 70% of the Sayus Law National Forest would have been clear cut and, and really changed from a natural forest to a, a, a kind of a manufactured forest. So that, that stopped. Uh, and so we've kind of held with that uh, 40%. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the natural forest that exists here on the Coast Range, in my view, with each passing year just keeps getting better and better and better. Th these are some of the most profoundly uh, productive, and I don't mean that just in a wood growing way, I mean in an every way of growing fish and wildlife and water. Th these are some of the most productive forests in the world, and they're right here in your backyard. I mean, it's, it's just a prodigious 
thing, and it uh, really merits our attention. Um, and, and I like to think that the, uh, you know, the trajectory of these forests has been changed. Just been a radically different uh, thing that's happened in the last 20 years. And I hope you all appreciate that. I think the video documentary does a really good job of telling that story. Um, I just want to say thank you all for coming, making this such a pleasurable event for me to be back in your hots. Uh, looking forward to the next time I get out here. Um, you got a terrific thing going. And um, I just, yeah, I'm just so proud of your community. I hope you are too.